I ultimately think Bitcoin will be worth a half a million dollars. It'll probably take four to five years. Uh, the ride will be rocky, but certainly worth it. Bitcoin has had at least 50% declines 10 times since 2012. Uh, in the last year, we've had two 50% declines, obviously the most recent one, but also one in May of 2021. And so if you're long Bitcoin, uh, you have to subject yourself to these type of volatility moves. And I'll just point out to people in Web 1, uh, the same sort of situation happened for Amazon. And if you were wise enough and disciplined enough to hold Amazon and let that company take full advantage of the network effects associated with it, you did very well. And I think that's going to happen with Bitcoin. I just remind people uh, what Jeff Bezos said at the 20th anniversary of the public offering of Amazon. People said, wow, the stock is so volatile. How, do, how were you able to hang in there? And he said, well, I was more focused on users and revenue growth. And for Bitcoin, since it's a network, uh, you have to be focused on the wallet growth and the interaction among the people in the network. And so I ultimately think Bitcoin will be worth a half a million dollars. It'll probably take four to five years. Uh, the ride will be rocky, but certainly worth it. So Bitcoin valued at half a million dollars, $500,000 in four years time. Does that correlate with a billion crypto users, a billion crypto wallets? Do you see that I, linked to the adoption yes. curve? Yeah. Yes, I do. And I think that there's a lot of research on that. And people say, well, how can you value Bitcoin? Fundamentally, you can value Bitcoin related to the network. Remember what Robert Metcalf, the MIT professor right. once said, one fax machine is probably worthless, but 100 million of them is worth something. The network itself is worth something. And so people mistake that uh, when they do their fundamental analysis on Bitcoin. So safe to say you're seeing this dip as a buying opportunity. I see the dip as a buying opportunity, but I also will tell people that there'll be more buying opportunities in the future. And so uh, you're better off if you want to own this asset to make a long term strategic decision, buy the asset and don't look at the asset. Because remember, we're human beings. Everybody is a long term investor, Michelle, until they have short term losses. The minute they have short term losses, they they change their investment appetite and behavior. Bitcoin is that it's supposed to serve as a hedge against rising inflation. You yourself have called it an inflation hedge, but we're not seeing Bitcoin respond to this higher inflation data now at a 40 year high. What's happened to the argument of it as an inflation hedge then? Yeah, if I if I did call it an inflation hedge, and I, and I don't know because I do a lot of interviews, I apologize for that because I don't I don't see it as an inflation hedge. What I see Bitcoin as is an early adopting technological asset. I see this as a technology that has two and a half percent global saturation. And as a result of which, if you study other technologies like this, they come with a very high oscillation and very high volatility. Could Bitcoin become an inflation hedge? I believe the answer to that is yes, but I think people are predicting out into the future. I'll point out that Amazon is way less volatile today, 25 years after its IPO. 10 years from now, Bitcoin will be 23 years old. It'll be way less volatile in my prediction uh, because there'll be more users, et cetera. And then maybe then if you and I are both around, we can you can interview me and I can, I can tell you that it's an inflation hedge, but it's not an inflation hedge yet. And I think that's a mistake when Bitcoin maximalists get out there and say that it's uh, better than gold. It may be better than gold, but we have to let the network effects take place so that we can actually really see that and analyze it. And we need that to happen as well for it to be a quote unquote inflation hedge. Bitcoin is better at being gold because of its portability, because of the technology is in limited supply. Remember, 65% of the available gold on planet Earth has been mined. That leaves you 35 more percent. And so there'll be increases in supply as prices come on. And what's unique about Bitcoin is that it's limited to the 21 million coins. Maybe two or three million of them have been lost. And so when you just look at it from a box checking, ticking exercise about store of value, Bitcoin hits more of those than gold does. But again, it's early. And so it's an early adoption story. It's going to come with volatility. I believe when Bitcoin is mature, it will be, quote unquote, more valuable than gold because of all of the technical properties associated with it. So um, again, 10 years from now, I'll make a prediction that Bitcoin has a larger market capitalization than gold. And it, you know, and it took it took gold 5,000 years to get to its current market capitalization. 
Bitcoin will surpass that uh, under 25 years from its inception. Is there anything that could make you change your mind again? Is there any reason that you could see yourself going, you know what? Turns out I was wrong about this whole Bitcoin thing. Listen, I've been humbled by life, Michelle. I've been humbled by markets. Uh, I've thought things that were true that turned out not to be true. And so anything can happen. I think if for some reason there's regulatory pressure on Bitcoin that I don't understand that is less than predictable on the landscape, that could be one of those reasons. Um, I don't think it'll be the technology, however, that we've had 12 and a half, 13 years of Bitcoin. It's proven to be a stable network and one that's unhackable. Some people say that quantum computing will come into, into gear and hack Bitcoin. Uh, I'm skeptical of that because I think Bitcoin will also, on the network side, have con quantum computing, so they'll balance each other out. Um, but yes, there could be something. Um, there's no certainty in life. I tell people, let's uh, allocate to Bitcoin appropriately. Uh, it's a 1% to 5% position at cost uh, for now. And so, yes, I, I don't know, you know, the beauty of the markets is the markets are very humbling and you never know what's going to get you in the markets. And I have found that anything you think that doesn't happen or can happen, Michelle, invariably does. So right. I don't want to I don't want to rule anything out, but I like what I see. I like I like the blockchain for sure. Uh, the blockchain is a massive delayering mechanism for the global economy. And so the blockchain will be with us for multiple decades, if not forever. Uh, and we're going to we're going to see a lot of things liquefy that previously weren't liquid as a result of the blockchain. And I'm excited by that. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now let's continue. So just imagine this nascent uh, token, this nascent cryptocurrency 10 years ago with a very minute market cap, people laughing at it as being irrelevant. Now uh, there's 1.5 or $1.7 trillion of total market capitalization of all cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin being the alpha predator of those, probably 40 to 45% of the overall market cap. And so it's now sizable enough where the IMF and the US government have to pay attention to it. So I'll, I'll predict three things. This will go way slower than Bitcoiners would like it to go. Number two, there's a lot of Bitcoiners out there that are libertarians. They want absolutely no regulation. Uh, too bad on that. You're going to get some fairly stringent regulation. And number three, uh, despite governmental attempts, whatever they may be, Bitcoin is with us to stay. Uh, the Chinese government is always saying they're banning Bitcoin or we're getting rid of Bitcoin, but they know Bitcoin exists in their culture. And in the system, it can be stored on a USB and carried around in somebody's pocket. So uh, it's not going away. Um, I have taken the belief, and perhaps this is too optimistic, that Bitcoin uh, will be okay in the United States because it already has been deemed as property by the IRS. And so the IRS treats Bitcoin as intangible property. I didn't learn many things in law school. I think one of the first things I learned, Michelle, was not to be a lawyer. That was the obvious thing I learned in law school. But secondarily, property rights in the United States, United Kingdom, places like Singapore are quite sacrosanct because they all tie back to British common law. And there's a 900 year legacy of legal precedent that protects property. And so the IRS has already said Bitcoin is property. It's going to be very, very tough for the United States, uh, given that designation to ban Bitcoin or to overly regulate Bitcoin, there would likely be administrative court relief because of it. So it's going to exist. Guys like Gary Gensler are super smart guys. Uh, before they got into the regulatory rubric and are wearing a political hat, he was teaching a course on blockchain at, at MIT, and he was espousing the virtues of blockchain. And so I don't think he wants to cede the intellectual capital and all of the potential business opportunities and jobs that could come from the cryptocurrency industry to other countries. So my guess is that they'll come up with an answer here. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll say one last thing, because I think this is important. The progressives, I cannot figure out because they don't like the big banks. They know that decentralized finance can help the underbanked. It's a long-term reduction in fees. And it's an empowerment movement for poor people, ultimately, if you really understand it. And yet they hate it. So they don't like the big banks and they hate Bitcoin. The only thing I can surmise is that they think that some people are getting rich on Bitcoin. And we, of course, we know socialists hate 
rich people and they hate seeing people get rich. So maybe that's the reason. Uh, but I think it's it's a big mistake. This is happening uh, and they're not going to be able to stop it. And just remember, the regulators wanted to stop uh, uh, Uber in the United States. Yeah. And the people want out. The people wanted Uber and the regulators weren't able to stop it. Bitcoin currently has 47 million wallets. You've heard of a decentralized autonomous organization. Well, yeah, Bitcoin yeah. is a Bitcoin is a DLO. It's a decentralized lobbying organization. Don't forget that about Bitcoin. There's 46 million people that are political activists as it relates to that one political issue. So you're surprised that it's not getting uh, more support from those on the left that, as you say, are very critical about uh, Wall Street and big banks and big finance, that this should actually be seen as something that they should support, considering it empowers individuals. But uh, yes, but I am surprised. I am surprised by that. But uh, these are people that are, uh, you know, they like control. They like command and control. Ultimately, they think they're smarter than the other people. And so they think that we should be living uh, under their dictation of what's right or wrong. And what I love about Bit- Bitcoin, it's a libertarian idea. And I think it's a it's a it's an individual is a movement, if you will. And uh, I think it'll win out. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where do you start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany, as you can hear, and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them. And if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange. And one of the biggest are, for example, Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well-established exchanges. But, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy, but the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who, and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.